Welcome to Heart of the Matter, the program which is committed to telling you the truth. The truth about who must do what and why if the Palestine problem, the cancer at the heart of international affairs, is to be cured before it consumes us all. This program's mission is to set a new agenda for informed and honest debate. This means that I'll be addressing questions which the mainstream media and almost all politicians are too frightened to ask. My guests for this series of conversations are men and women of all faiths and none. They are voices which powerful vested interests would prefer citizens not to hear. Last week in the first programme of this series, viewers were invited to get to know me and how it was that I became aware of the difference between the lies and the truth of history as it relates to the making and sustaining of conflict in and over Palestine. My first guest is an Israeli who now lives in reluctant exile here in the UK. He is Professor Ilan Papi. He is Israel's leading new or revisionist historian. The terms new and revisionist really mean honest. Like all Israelis, he was brought up conditioned to believe Zionism's version of the history of the making and sustaining of the Arab-Israeli conflict. It wasn't until he went to England to continue his academic studies that he had access to documentation which enabled him to understand that Zionism's version is a propaganda lie. For his books, his latest is The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine, and his public speaking, Ilan is respected and admired by many people around the world, with the exception, of course, of supporters of Israel, right or wrong, and Zionists in particular. Ilan, Zionism has named and listed more than 7,000 Israeli Jews it regards as mortal enemies. The list is available on the Zionist website and it's called the Shit List. Shit standing for self-hating Israeli traitor. Now you have the distinction, and I suspect the honour, of being at the very top of this list. You are Zionism's Jewish enemy number one. I'd like to start by asking you to explain to me the Zionist mindset that perceives you as a traitor. From Zionism's perspective, what is it exactly that you have betrayed? I think, Alan, that the main uh, betrayal, as far as the Zionist movement is concerned, is that I could have been a prodig prodigy uh, of the movement. I could have been a very effective spokesperson for that movement, being a leading academic, someone who graduated from Oxford, someone who was born in the country, and really represents everything which the country, or the state rather, is proud of. And instead of that, if you want, all these assets are being employed to expose the crimes of Zionism and to tackle Zionist as an unacceptable ideology. You mean you, you could have become magnificent for them in the selling of their propaganda lies? Absolutely, as, as uh, some of their leading academics are doing willing to serve as ambassadors and ambassadress for the Zionist cause. So it was, it's not just the particularly, particular views which I hold that uh, condemns Zionism for its policies towards the Palestinians that are the heart of this matter, although uh, they are also part of it. But there are many other people who uh, uh, share my view. But I think it is this particular uh, position which uh, I occupy as part of my career and, uh, and the way my life had progressed that makes it very difficult for them to digest. We'll, we'll come to some of the truth of history um, a little later. I want to look at, at self-hating. Is a label Zionism pins on its Jewish opponents because it can't accuse them, as it accuses Gentiles, of being anti-Semitic for the blackmail purpose of closing down debate. But what's the logic, twisted though it might be behind this Zionist concept of the self-hating Jew, which incidentally is a concept described by the Jewish writer Will Self as hideous and reductive. What's the logic? The logic is actually uh, uh, an attempt to create a genealogy of self-hating Jews that goes back to the biblical times. It's a, almost a religious journey as much as it is an ethnic one. Uh, if you read very carefully the more scholarly, or allegedly more scholarly uh, works, 
that uh, were written about uh, people like myself, they always begin by uh, a, a drawing a genealogical tree of self-hating Jews. But what does it actually mean? Oh, I'll, 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 I'll come to that. It, it means that it's almost part of the Jewish existence and psyche is to have, if you want, insane Jews, unwell Jews, people who uh, uh, there couldn't be any logical or moral explanation for the position they had taken apart from something which is wrong with them mentally. It's kind of a mental illness to, of a Jew to uh, criticize Judaism. Now, of course, uh, most of the Jews in the world would never regard someone like myself as a self-hating Jew. It is a very particular group of ideological Zionists that would uh, uh, take criticism on Israel's policies as criticism on Judaism. One should not, and I'm sure we'll talk about, about it a bit later, one should not at all uh, 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 forget the distinction between the two. But, but this is the idea that it's, it's very much the other side of the anti-Semitic accusation. If you deal with Zionism, you deal with Judaism. And if you deal with Judaism and you don't endorse it, you're an anti semite well, well, let's come straight to that point. In the first program of this series, I explained the difference between Judaism and Zionism. And I said knowledge of this difference is the key to understanding. Not the second key, not the first key, the key. How would you characterize the difference between Judaism and Zionism and its significance? I think in, in a nutshell, uh, Zionism is a version, an interpretation of Judaism that at least to my mind and to the minds of quite a few Jews now around the world abuses the basic values and heritage of Judaism. It's, 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 an, it's an attempt to take a religion, a culture, a civilization in a way and condense it into an ethnic identity in a colonialist context. All right, could we be even more specific and say that Judaism is the religion of Jews, not all Jews, because not all Jews are religious. And like Islam, like Christianity, it has at its core a set of moral values and ethical principles. Absolutely. Whereas Zionism is a sectarian colonial enterprise um, which founded a state on uh, terrorism and ethnic cleansing, which we'll talk about uh, in due course, and makes a complete mockery of the principles of Judaism. Yes, I, I, I don't know about mockery, but definitely it stands for ethnic values of supremacy, of exclusivity, which uh, are not part of the international, uh, of, of the more humanist uh, uh, Jewish heritage. Uh, it's, it's actually more than mockery. It's manipulating humanist international values in order that it could be used for pursuing ethnic policies on the ground in Palestine. And could we say that the real significance is in two things? When you know, I'm talking about the Gentile world now essentially, among whom most Jews live. When you know the difference between the two, you understand A, why you can be critical of the Zionist state of Israel without being anti-Semitic. And perhaps even more important, you understand why it is wrong to blame all Jews everywhere for the crimes of the minority. That's what I see as a significance. Does that make sense to you? Especially if you treat the word minority as a state organ. Even, I would go even further. I, I would say that the state policies do not implicate every Jew who lives in Israel. Right. Uh, in fact, the majority of the Jews in Israel are not implicated by these policies. Uh, uh, and it's an ideology of, it's a state ideology. It's a, a certain political and military elite that carries out these policies. Uh, it is endorsed by sections of the society, and that's where their blame it's lies. Exactly, exactly. But, but I do think it's very important to, to understand it. It's a very narrow part of Judaism, Zionism. It's, 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 it has much more to do, to my mind, with German national romanticism and colonialist heritage than with uh, the Jewish world. Let's come to you personally for a moment. In August last year, you decided it was time for you and your family to leave Israel, and, and you came here to live. Now, I know the authorities and their agencies in Israel were making your academic work at Haifa University impossible, and your life in general impossible. 
But was it also the case that you really had to take seriously threats to kill you? Yes, this is also part of the, uh, a, a, of the atmosphere. It was not so much the threats against me that I was terrified about. It's uh, the threats against my children, my two boys, which really uh, were the final nail on the, in the coffin, you if you want. You mean there were threats against uh, Yeah, oh, very specific, very specific. And, and therefore, I thought that this is something which I, I can endanger myself, but I, I have no right to endanger my kids for something I'm doing. When they're 18, they can decide for themselves whether they want to pursue this line yeah. in life or not. But definitely, this was part of it. But uh, that by itself was not enough to cause someone to leave. I, I, uh, and I still do hope to be in, in both places, to work from the inside and the outside as much as the circumstances would allow it. But the bottom line point is, your life and all the lives of your children were in danger. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. For opposing Zionism. Of course, everybody who opposes such a hegemonic ideology, I think, runs into trouble. Uh, it's true that Palestinians who do it uh, suffer much more than Jews like myself who do it, because then the state has no inhibitions. In our case, it's a bit more complicated. Let's now come to grips with the truth of history as opposed to Zionism's propaganda lies. Now, the State of Israel was created mainly by Zionist terrorism and ethnic cleansing. And in your latest book, this magnificent book, The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine, you reveal that this crime against the Palestinians did not happen by accident and was completely pre-planned. Now, what's the essence of the true story as you uncovered it from the documented record. I'm asking you to summarize in some minutes yeah. some of the guts of your book. But from the 1930s onwards, under the guidance of uh, the person who would become the first Prime Minister of Israel, David Ben-Gurion, uh, a group of Zionist leaders began to systematically plan the ethnic cleansing of the Palestinians. Uh, they could not do it in the 1930s because A, they were not ruling the country, Britain was still responsible for law and order under the mandatory regime, and secondly, they did not possess the military means to carry out such, a, such an operation. All these changed after the Second World War, because after the Second World War, first of all, Britain decided they had enough of Palestine. It was very clear that there's going to be a vacuum uh, that could be uh, utilized by the Zionist movement. And secondly, under the uh, impression of the genocide of the Jews in, in, in Europe, uh, it was easier to recruit money and weapons for the Jewish community in Palestine, supposedly against the second Holocaust, this time to be carried out by the Arab world and so on, which of course was not complete, complete fabrication yeah. of the uh, uh, Arab uh, governments or the Palestinian leadership's uh, plans. Yeah. But this was very effective. And in a matter of three years, they created, uh, they being the Zionist leadership, created a very effective military organization while, one should say, at the same time, the Palestinians were naively waiting for the British to hand them over Palestine as they handed over Iraq to the Iraqis and, and Egypt to the Egyptians. And um, these three years were very well uh, and effectively used by the Zionist leadership uh, uh, until the British did leave eventually in February, uh, or decided to leave in February 1947. And even before they actually left, which is May 1948, the uh, Zionist forces started to uh, ethnically cleanse Palestine from February 1947 uh, uh, onwards. Uh, and, in, and, and in earnest, the, the ethnic cleansing started a year later in February 1948, but there were experiments a year before to see whether it worked. What are some of the worst six or, or even any examples of actual ethnic cleansing in practice? Well, I think the, 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 there are two chapters which stand out particularly. Is, is worse than others, although all of them are not very uh, sympathetic. One is in April 1948, that is a month before the British leave, and actually a month, it's important to, to understand, a month before the Arab armies enter Palestine. So this whole myth that some more critical Israeli historians put forward that the, there were expulsions, but they were a response to a, an Arab military invasion are not true, because the worst kind of ethnic cleansing took place a month before the Arab That army. was the first 300,000. Exactly. The Arab armies actually went in in order to try and stop it. The, so in, in April, there was something which I call in my book the herbicide of Palestine, the destruction of the urban centers. Uh, uh, in Haifa and Jaffa, in both cases, ten thousands of people in one day were pushed to the harbor, were shot 
in order to trigger their uh, escape. And, and mountain boats uh, which could hardly bear, uh, contain them. And the scenes in these two harbors of uh, whole Arab cities being evicted by Israeli uh, soldiers uh, in one day, as I say, in a few hours, under, by the way, the, the watch of the British soldiers who saw it and did nothing. And all running to a predetermined plan. Absolutely. All according to predetermined plan uh, is something which what, what is probably most surprising than anything else is not so much the silence of the world or the British or so on, but the silence of the, of the same Jews who knew what, happened, knew what happened in Europe. Maybe some of them even saw what happened in Europe and yet had no scruples, no inhibitions in, in doing almost the same to the Palestinians. The second chapter, which is, stands out in its cruelty and, and callousness, is towards the end of the ethnic lending operation in October 1948, where the Palestinians in the Upper Galilee already knew what awaits them and therefore put some fight, unlike the, the other villagers. And that triggered the worst kind of atrocities, uh, raping of women, killing of babies, uh, uh, and a forceful and very barbaric uh, ethnic cleansing took place there. Although to the credit of the Palestinians, one should say, a uh, few of the villages succeeded in even withstanding these, this assault. And the end result of the ethnic cleansing is 800,000 Palestinians driven from their homes. Ilan, the world is only aware of one great denial, the denial of the Nazi Holocaust in Europe. But of course there is another the denial of Zionist ethnic cleansing in Palestine. Now, surely, yes, those two crimes against humanity were different in scale. But is not the denial of one as obscene as the denial of the other? Definitely it is, especially because the people who lead the campaign for the denial of the other are the people who claim to represent the, uh, the first catastrophe. In other words, the people who fight against the Holocaust denial uh, are those who quite often deny the Nakba, uh, the Palestinian catastrophe, and I think that's where the moral absurdity and and, uh, and uh, an ethical uh, position lies. Coming back to the moral absurdity, it just occurred to me, one of our great uh, UK Jewish playwrights, I can't remember which one, he, in a radio interview once, he was asked to describe what you're talking about, and he made a very simple statement. He said, the child abused becomes the child abuser. In a way, is there, is there something? Oh, very much so, very much so. There is this uh, 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 victim becoming a victimizer uh, uh, in a very quick uh, uh, process. Although one should say that the people who executed the ethnic cleansing, definitely the people who contemplated it, were not the direct victims of the Holocaust. Right. They were there long before the Holocaust. Yeah. But, but it is true about some of the people who took part in it, definitely. Yeah. Right. I'd like now to examine with you the two great propaganda lies which underpin Zionism's version of history since the creation of the State of Israel in 48. A version of history which the political and media establishments of the Gentile world accept as real history. One is that Israel has lived in constant danger of annihilation, the driving into the sea of its Jews. The other is that Israel did not have a Palestinian or other Arab partners for peace. Do either of these assertions contain elements of truth or are they complete propaganda nonsense? Well, the first one is not complete propaganda nonsense, although as my colleague Avi Shleim has shown in his excellent book, The Iron Wall, uh, in fact, uh, in most junctures in history when the Arab world uh, offered a chance for peace, it was Israel that rejected it and not vice versa. Yes, there's no question about that. It was always an, an Israeli rejection. Absolutely. Uh, but on the other hand, it, it is true that, of course, the, the, the kind of policies Zionism pursued and later on the state of Israel did not make it a friend of the Arab world. And it's not surprising that there was a high level of hostility towards the Jewish state in the Arab world and therefore objectively one could say that there was such a danger, that yeah. there was definitely uh, uh, a willingness to defend the Palestinians. But the possibility of driving the Jews oh, no, no, no. was never real. No, I, mean, no, I in, don't think it was. In 48-49, the Arabs, as I understand it, invaded only to try to secure the land Absolutely. that they... Absolutely. No question of wiping I mean, out no, Jews. The balance of power was always in... The, 
such that the Jewish state was never in any danger of annihilation. That's so, for sure. So, could we sum up those lies by saying that the conclusion they support is this, that Zionism's assertion that it lived in danger of annihilation was the cover which allowed Israel to get away where it mattered most in American Western Europe with presenting its aggression as self-defense and itself as the victim when Absolutely. actually it is the oppressor. Yeah. But I would add to this that there is, it was a manipulation of a fear that, that is, is inherent to the group of Jews who came to Palestine. And you cannot, you cannot uh, uh, forcefully represent what you have just talked about without uh, a high degree of fear among the people that you control. Yeah. And, and, it was, and, and it is this fear uh, that I stress because it's combating this fear would be part of the reconciliation process. It's not just a matter of saving the Palestinians, but if you want to create any chance for peace, you ha one has to understand how this fear was manipulated deliberately, by deliberately and nurtured by the, by, the, by, by the political elite. Yeah. Now, Western politicians and diplomats and mainstream media people are still clinging to the idea of a two-state solution. I think, as you do, that it's dead and been dead for a long time. But I have a particular reason. And it goes back to a private conversation I had with Shimon Peres in 1980, when he was the leader of Israel's main labor opposition, hoping to replace Begin as prime minister. He said to me, in 1980, it's already too late for peace on any terms Arafat can accept. And I asked him why. And Peres said, quote, every day that passes sees new bricks on new settlements. Begin knows exactly what he's doing. He is stuffing the West Bank with settlers to create the conditions for a Jewish civil war. He knows that no Israeli prime minister is going down in history as the one who gave the order to the Jewish army to shoot Jews to get them out of the West Bank. He paused and he said, I'm not. My point is this, and you've already touched upon it. If it was too late in 1980, when there were only 70,000 settlers, how much more too late is it today when there are half a million settles, settlers, that number rising on a daily basis and Palestinian land being taken on a daily basis? Well, I, I think this, this is part of, of a plan that actually Paris today, as the president of Israel, endorses. Maybe he didn't endorse it at the time, but now he totally endorses it. This is the idea that uh, it's, it's even more complicated. You, what, what the Israeli consensus or consensual position tries to create on the ground is two things. To annex directly to Israel large chunks of the West Bank and at the same time declaring to the world at large that they don't mind if what is left is being declared as a Palestinian state. In fact, what happened now, which couldn't have happened in 79, that the same Israeli policy can be seen as part of uh, a so-called peace process, or even a peace, peaceful solution of a two-state uh, uh, model. Ilan, there are Israeli commentators who say that for real peace, many of the settlers in the occupied West Bank would leave, be prepared to move out in return for generous financial compensation. I think that up to half of them probably would, but that would still leave about a quarter of a million whom I think would fight a civil war. And that's why I think, A, that no Israeli prime minister is ever going to take on the settlers. And it's why I think, B, that no American president is ever going to ask an Israeli prime minister to take on the settlers. What do you think? I think it's even more than that. I think it was true again. I, th I think what you describe is very true about the 1980s. It's a very fair description. I think today it's a different picture. Today it's not a matter of an Israeli government unwilling to evict settlers settlers uh, from the major settlement blocks because of a fear of a civil war. It's because the basic Israeli position is that this land belongs to them. There are actually those who regard themselves as part of the Labour Party or a part of the peace camp would say we are making concessions to the Palestinians. We are giving them something which belongs to us. I hate this word concessions. How can you steal somebody's land and be talked no, about that, as that, the that, BBC that, even uses this word. It's always concessions. I but I want us to understand this is the mentality. Elan, just take a historical perspective. Is there not a case for saying that the real villains in the story since 1967 are actually the governments of the major Western powers 
the one in Washington DC especially, for allowing Israel to defy international law by settling occupied territory. Yes, I totally agree. I think that it was probably difficult in 67 to demand uh, a deconstruction of, of 19, the 1948 situation. It was much more difficult, yep. I agree. But definitely after 67, when the Israeli occupation was taking, uh, was formed, and it was so easy to see what they were doing on the ground, and that they were violated very clear uh, international uh, law uh, regulations and United Nations resolution, I agree that they were the main culprits, because uh, the, the reality of the occupation was created uh, with a very close watch by the, the, the Western powers, who knew what was going on, uh, and allowed it so for the own reasons. So what you're saying is in the aftermath of the 67 war, had the major powers led by America simply read the riot act to Israel and said we've got to sort out the peace but we are not going to allow you to build settlements. As a complete violation of international law. At least they could, have eased, they could have not solved the Palestine problem as it is, but they could have eased the life of the people who came fell under Israeli occupation in United States. Could we also say they could have stopped the Palestine problem from becoming unmanageable, perhaps? <laughs> maybe, maybe yes, definitely. Ilan, how would you characterize Israeli policy today? I mean the policy it is implementing as opposed to its public policy statements. I think it, the Israeli policies are aimed at completing what Israelis would call the Zionist project which is uh, securing a final uh, map of the State of Israel with a clear ethnic uh, uh, reality in it. Uh, starting from the north, uh, I don't think they have yet settled on the northern border with Lebanon. I think they're still hoping to get the Litani River. To the Litani. To the Litani River. They don't know exactly how to do it. Whereas I think the, that in the Golan Heights, they are willing to have some sort of a territorial compromise with the Syrians. Um, in the West Bank, we already talked about it, but repeated, it's very important. They want to ethnically cleanse half of the West Bank uh, in order not to change the balance of the demographic balance inside uh, what they would call the Jewish state. Uh, but even that is not the end of the story, I think, because there are too many Palestinians in Israel. My view, it picks up from where you left off, is that Zionism's own, own end-game strategy now leaves nothing to the imagination. Israel's leaders believe that by means of brute force and reducing them to abject poverty, they can break the will of the Palestinians to continue the struggle for their right. The assumption being that at a point, out of total despair, the Palestinians will be prepared to say, OK, we'll accept crumbs from Zionism's table. The question that's almost too awful to think about is this. What will the Zionists, bearing in mind what you said in your previous answer, what will the Zionists do when it becomes apparent, even to them, that they can't destroy Palestinian nationalism, and bombs and bullets and brutal repressive measures? My guess is that they, the Zionists, will go for a final round of ethnic cleansing to drive the Palestinians off the West Bank into Jordan and beyond. That, I fear, will be Zionism's final solution to the Palestine problem. And if it happens, the West Bank will be turned red with blood, mostly Palestinian blood. And if there be any honest reporters, they would describe it as a Zionist Holocaust. Ilan, do you think that's too pessimistic a view of a possible future if a Zionist dictated course is followed? I think it, it has ingredients of what I think will happen. I, I think what, what will happen is only in part. I, I don't think the Zionist uh, movement, or in, that's called it the State of Israel, the State of Israel doesn't need the kind of scenario that you describe. I think what it needs is two clear situations in the West Bank. One is a part that is totally annexed to them, and there may be uh, through bloodshed or maybe without bloodshed. The first things are quite weakened now. Uh, they would get a free uh, uh, ride in a way to, to nobody stopping them to annex the, these areas to Israel and, and ethnically cleanse the Palestinians who live there. But I don't think they would, at least the majority of them, in, in the leadership would mind seeing a, a, a Palestinian place surrounded by huge a high wall and uh, electric fences uh, very much as in the Gaza Strip existing especially if they could convince the Palestinian leadership to keep it as a state that doesn't 
uh, disturb them. However, if this would be impossible, maybe what you describe could be the second phase. It was Moshe Dayan, Israel's one-eyed warlord, who said, it's them or us. Could it not be said that those three little words, them or us, tell us everything, and particular that the hardest core Zionists do not have a category of thought that enables them to seriously consider making an accommodation with the Palestinians. I mean an accommodation acceptable to the right. Palestinians. Yeah, I, I think this is the state ideology what you describe. It's a state ideology. It's, it's, uh, you, Jews will not be able to survive in Palestine, will not be able to have a quality of life and survival if the Palestinians are there. Uh, I think the reality on the ground in places like the Galilee and Jerusalem so is a bit more complicated and, and part of the thing that may defeat that ideology is not only the Palestinian resistance movement but also the fact that on a daily basis it doesn't always work although the government puts a lot of effort in creating segregation that would prove that point very much like in white South Africa. I think what I'm really asking you is do you think Zionism has ever seriously been interested in peace for the Palestinians? Oh, no, 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 I don't think Zionism as a state ideology, as a political movement, was interested only in one thing, in creating a clean, clear Jewish space within the Arab world, which uh, has no Arabs or Palestinians in it, and is connected to the West, and has very little to do with the Arab world. That was the main strategy, it still is the main strategy of the State of Israel. All of human history tells us that you make peace in order to have security. It's not the other way around. So why is it that Israel's leaders have always insisted and continue to insist in putting the security cart before the peace horse? Well, I think the main reason is that uh, by that you totally disarm your, uh, the other side and then you can dictate to them whatever you want. A, a weakened Palestinian leadership that has no military base is a peon in the, the great game, and Israel can dictate to it what it wants. It was always surprised when, even under these circumstances, Palestinian leaders so far were unwilling in the right uh, moment of truth to, to surrender to this dictate. And the, the second reason is Zan, the, the basis of Israel as an ethnic state is the ability not just to deter the Palestinians, but deter the Arab world at large. They need military superiority over the Middle East as a whole, in their view. I don't think it's true that they need it, but that's what they perceive as the basis for their survival. And therefore you have to totally disarm anyone who wants to uh, be part of an American-led peace operation. But it's really a ploy to pretend that you're interested in peace while oh, actually absolutely. you frustrate the process and you go on creating facts. Absolutely, absolutely. Why are most Jews in the world today silent on the matter of the crimes of the Zionist state. Is it simply that most Jews don't know that Israel has committed crimes or is it that they don't want to know? And if they don't want to know, why? I think it's a combination of the two and maybe even the third factor. First of all, there was a silent Jewish support ever since the creation of the State of Israel to the state's policies. So if you begin to acknowledge that what was done was wrong, you acknowledge that you played a role in it, whether you were a citizen of the state or you weren't. And I think that deters people from uh, going to such a journey. Second thing is, any Jew who tried in the past to voice clear criticism on the state of Israel was immediately branded as a self-hating Jew. And thirdly, I think some of the Jews don't know because uh, uh, newspapers such as the Jewish Chronicles or the Jerusalem Post are their only source of information and through these kinds of uh, media you get a very rosy picture and a very twisted picture of what Israel is doing. I believe the key to peace or not is in the hands mainly of the Jews of the world and Jewish Americans especially. I also know that the sleeping giant of classical anti-Semitism is coming alive again in the Western uh, world and that a prime cause of this is the Zionist state's behavior. I can therefore see a future scenario in which all Jews 
are blamed for the crimes of the few, with the possibility of that happens of another great turning against the Jews. Holocaust too for shorthand terminology. So it's my view that the Jews of the world have a vested interest in speaking out to protect themselves by saying in effect, Zionism does not speak for us and we are not complicit in its crimes. Now those are my thoughts, the thoughts of a concerned and caring Gentile. They will probably have no impact on Jews because I'm a Gentile. But you're not only Jewish, you're an Israeli Jew. What are your thoughts on that subject? I think it's, again, it's, it's part of, 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 of the reality. Uh, and, and let me start with what I agree. I do agree that the Jews in general in the world, and the American Jews in particular, can play a very significant and crucial role in changing the reality on the ground. And I do agree also that uh, the present policies of Israel and the present American support for Israel is going to end in a catastrophe for which the Jews in America will be blamed and therefore anti-Semitism would come uh, and, and rise again. And therefore you're right that they have a vested interest in doing that. I also think that the Jewish, that the uh, American support for Israel is a bit more complicated than that. I think there is a Christian element, very strong Christian Zionist element that has very little to do with the Jews. It has to do with fundam Ameri the history of American Christian fundamentalism. The Christian Zionists. The Christian Zionists. The Christian fundamentalism. And therefore the task is more formidable in the United States than just that. But. Uh, I, I do agree that there is a great, I don't know about the second holocaust or not, but I do agree that um, if things go wrong, and things will go wrong for them, for America if these policies continue, uh, the scapegoat would be the Jewish community in America, rightly or wrongly. And uh, I would be very worried as an American Jew, uh, if not on a moral basis, and I think they should on a moral basis oppose the state, of Israel, at least on, from their own survival point of view, they should be much more critical about what Israel is doing to, to the Palestinians and in the Arab world. Because of their history of persecution, which climaxed with the obscenity of the Nazi Holocaust, Jews, most Jews, have been conditioned by Zionism to believe that they can never again trust Gentiles and that a day might come when they will be persecuted again and will have need of Israel perhaps as a ref refuge of last resort. Now, that way of thinking being so, if it is so, it follows, or so it seems to me, that the only way of ending the silence of the Jews is by assisting them to understand that the anti-Semitism which could threaten them is being provoked by the Zionist state's behavior and American support for it. Is that analysis, albeit a Gentile analysis, that strikes chords with you? Yes, it does. I, I think it, 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 there's a lot in it. The, the suspicion, uh, as they put it in Israel, the world is against us. We cannot trust anyone. We can only trust ourselves, and so on. It's very uh, strongly uh, embedded in the uh, Israeli psyche. And definitely one way of uh, unpacking it is by, by trying to show that the very demon that they're afraid of is the, the demon that they themselves help to nurture. Um, uh, uh, but again, I, I think that situations of these kinds are more complex. In, in other words, I, I think you need uh, not just to convince them that they are responsible for increasing anti-Semitism, but that they really complicate unnecessarily and endanger unnecessarily the relationship between the West and the Arab world and the Muslim world. And this is a role, a negative role that they will play and the world will probably not forgive them for playing. Now, in the preface to volume two of my book, there is an explicit message from me to the media and publishing executives and politicians. I say to them, you are dangerously wrong to believe that by being complicit in Zionism suppression of the truth, you are doing serving the Jewish interests best than your own. What I say to them is, by not coming to grips with the truth of history, and in particular what we've discussed, the difference between Judaism and Zionism, you are helping to set up all Jews to be blamed. Now that's a very serious charge for me to make. Do you think there's substance to it? There is substance to it. I, I, as there is substance to saying that the policies 
it, I think it, it, it stems from the fact that the policies of Israel are a very important factor in the re-emergence of anti-Semitism or the new anti-Semitism as it is called or the old anti-Semitism reincarnated and therefore any one or any important body that allows these policies to continue doesn't criticize them or even endorses them is uh, culpable of creating that kind of reality we're talking about. Right, now the one state Elan. It's of course one thing to talk about the need for one state and even to make the case convincingly for it as being the only real hope for justice and lasting peace. But how can it come about when nuclear armed gut Zionists in Greater Israel and their awesomely powerful lobby in America are absolutely opposed to it? Well, they are po I think it doesn't start with the one state solution. It starts with the fact that if we will say to ourselves as peace activists or, or more conscientious persons that because of the Israeli nuclear power and the uh, uh, unlimited support Israel gets from the United States, we can do nothing. It means that the scenarios we were talking about or the destruction of Palestine would be implemented. So uh, it's not important whether the Israelis and the Americans uh, reject the one state solution. The important thing is that unopposed, the destruction of Palestine will become a reality and it's a big question whether the civil society in the West, the civil society around the world, concerned governments, conscientious Israelis and the resistance movement of the Palestinians can face this coalition and create a different reality of reconciliation and peace for everyone who lives there instead of this scenario where one group of people excludes and exterminates them, in a way the other group of people and, and therefore it's not just a one state solution that is at stake here it's the future of the Palestinians as people as human beings is at stake. But it's also the future of the Jews who live in the region. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I agree. Iran's president has been quoted as saying he wants to wipe Israel off the map. He said nothing like that. I think we both know that. We both yeah. know what he actually said. But the point is, yes, a one-state solution means the end of Zionism. It yes. means the de-Zionization of Palestine. Absolutely. But it does not harm the Jews who currently live there. All those who want to stay become citizens with complete, full, equal rights with the Palestinians. I mean, if enough Jews of the world understood this concept, do you think it could gain traction? Yes, and, and I think this is the core of the issue of the one state. The core of the issue of the one state, that it would replace a racist state. It will replace an apartheid state with a shared democracy, with a state for all its citizens. This is the, the idea. No, but I would add something else. It will replace a Zionist state. It will create a state which will be far more Jewish than a Zionist state because a Zionist state is not a Jewish state. Everything that the Zionist state was doing abuses All the, the very principles and yes. values of Judaism. Yeah. Therefore, this is a very important issue. I have written and often say on public platforms that I believe the Jews generally speaking, are the intellectual elite of the Western civilization. And that generally speaking, the Palestinians are the intellectual elite of the Arab world. It follows, or so it seems to me, that what these two peoples could do together in peace and partnership is the stuff that real dreams are made of. They could change the region for the better, and by doing that, give new hope and inspiration to the whole world. Am I only dreaming? No, I, I think you're absolutely right. I, I don't know if they are the intellectual elites or not, but definitely a synergic uh, 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 power of these two uh, people could have created in the land of Palestine uh, wonderful things. Um, and um, what you are also, I think, implying is how close they are and how, how uh, similar they are. And uh, this similarity uh, is something that could easily uh, um, fortify the idea of a one-state solution, I think, that I'm believing in. And, and I do think that if you salvage the whole issue from the political elites in Israel, in America, and in the West, uh, and you allow the basic human energy to flow... So the ordinary decency of people. Yeah, exactly. I, I think you will, you will see that this is a soluble problem and not one that 
has to endanger the stability of the world at large. In my book, I say to readers that there were times in the writing of it when I wanted to cry out with the pain of knowing how much Israel's leaders have deceived the Jews of Israel and the Jews of the world. Now, if this Gentile can truly feel that pain, and he does, how much worse is it for you, an Israeli Jew? It's worse because uh, I was deceived from the very moment I was part of the educational system. It's, it's the deceivers here are not just the politicians. I never uh, believed in politicians anyway from the age of 12. But I think what's really important is that your moral supervisors, your teachers, your family, your parents, uh, your, anyone who was a moral role model, was actually selling a fabricated, fabricated version of the reality and uh, was lying to you. That, and that's very painful. And struggling against it is, is definitely not an easy process. To my knowledge, no Jew, Israeli or other, has ever spoken publicly in such a profound way as Elan Papi did in that conversation. He said that Israel's policies are a very important factor in the re-emergence of anti-Semitism and that any one or any important body that allows these policies to continue or doesn't criticize them or endorses them is culpable of activating the rise of anti-Semitism. He said the Jews of the world and America in particular can play a very significant and crucial role in changing the reality on the ground and that they must speak out about the crimes of the Zionist state in order to protect themselves. The present policies of Israel and American support for them are going to end in catastrophe for which the Jews of America will be blamed and anti-Semitism will rise again. On the same subject, he also said, if things go wrong, and they will go wrong for America if present policies continue, the scapegoat will be the Jewish community in America, rightly or wrongly. He believed, he added, that American Jews should oppose Israel's policies on moral grounds, but that from their own survival point of view, they should be much more critical about what Israel is doing to the Palestinians. That's all for this week. From this heart to yours, good night. <laughs>